right now we're going to launch now into the the hackathon presentations. Um, so so I'm going to start with a kind of quick overview of uh, all of the work, and then we're going to we're kind of we're going to go through each each one. Uh, let me go and get the slides pulled up. Let's see. Sure. Okay. So, so this is kind of just a quick summary of, of our some hackathon stats. Uh, over the we, we uh, first I'd like to thank everyone who who participated in the hackathon. It, uh, everyone worked really hard over the course of the week on, on their respective problems and dealt with all the challenges of, of, of the working through the notebooks and the data sets and all the computer uh, the Jupyter Hub and Google Colab. Uh, challenges making uh, making sure that you didn't run out of memory or randomly get cut off because of some some random bug somewhere in the cloud. Uh, overall, it seemed to work pretty well. We we had over twenty four thousand Slack messages sent over the course of the week, so that's uh, there's a a lot of chatting going on among the teams. We had a lot tons of questions and feedback uh, on the main threads as well. Uh, we had sixty three teams at the start. Uh, each of there was about five people in each one, and then uh, by the time we got to the end, we had some mergers, some switching around, uh, some people dropped out for various reasons because, yeah, this is a huge time commitment uh, and, and takes a lot of time to get in there. Uh, so we had we ended up having 43 teams submitting presentations. Um, of the challenge problems, El Nino had the most submissions, uh, 13. Uh, the other problems had either seven or eight submissions uh, and a lot of interesting results, which we'll go over the course of the afternoon. Uh, Want to want to mention that uh, everyone who has completed the whole the whole the whole week uh, will receive this uh, digital certificate of achievement. So we have a, a example of one of these over here. So we'll we'll get those out to you in the next week or so. Uh, kind of way to recognize all your hard work. Uh, we know this is a lot going into it, and we hope you like the overall aim of this was to try to learn as much as possible uh, and get real world machine learning experience. Uh, and I, that does include going through all the challenges of dealing with processing data and working with code you, you, you haven't seen before and have to kind of uh, work through and then trying out different problems. And in a lot of cases, you don't know a priori which method is going to work well, which one's going to work poorly. And uh, um, it seems like a lot of teams saw, saw a lot of both. Um, it's uh, in my experience, it's, it's really hard to get a slight improvement. It's really easy to do a lot worse. Uh, but I did see that a lot of teams were able to to make some improvements on on, on the baseline approaches and try and try a lot of different things, uh, and, and made some and made some great visualizations and uh, appreciate also those who who like completely dropped in like started this without without as much experience in, in machine learning and still uh, and a lot of people struggled and, and made some and some made some progress there and uh, a lot of people feel like they have a lot to learn. I, Everyone's on their own part of the journey, and uh, I'm I'm glad that everyone who put in time to 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 give this a shot. So so thank you. Uh, we are going to send out surveys too about uh, your your hackathon experience. We already gotten some feedback in the Slack, and encourage everyone to send more positive and negative, so that we can continue to refine this in the future and and get uh, better feedback. Uh, and like address some of the issues that, that we've run into and, and see what we can do better to make this as uh, informative and, and fun experience as possible. 
uh, the schedule for the rest of the afternoon. We're going to go through each of the, the, the problems and, and so our kind of uh, leads and helpers for, for, for each part will we'll, uh, sort of kind of go, go through each, pre each of the presentations from the different teams uh, this way. Everyone gets to kind of have their work highlighted and you can see what all the other teams were doing over the course of the week and see what worked and maybe what didn't work as well. Uh, and what, what lessons learned, people learned during this time. Uh, at two o'clock we'll have El Nino, which will be Encore and Karthik. Uh, uh, Gabrielle uh, Gantos is going to uh, uh, speak at around, around 2.50 on Holodeck. Uh, and then, then we'll take a break at 3.30 and then we'll continue with, uh, Gabrielle will do microphysics. Uh, then Charlie Becker will take over at around 4.10 on Gecko and then I will finish out at 4.40 on Goes and wrap up the whole, the whole day. Uh, we might, this might slip a little bit depending on how, how, how long it takes to go through the, all the presentations, but uh, so, so bear with us on, on, on some of this. Uh, if you have questions along the way, we'll also please continue to submit them in the Slido. Uh, and we'll try to take a little bit of time uh, in between presentations to, to answer any questions or, or, or that, that come up. So with that, um, I, I also want to uh, uh, stop, I'm gonna switch windows for a second because I, I, I also wanna make sure we, uh, before we jump into this, uh, again, wanna thank all of the, uh, all the people involved with making this a success, uh, our organizing committee, especially Tasia Peterson, uh, our, our, our main admin and uh, uh, orchestrator uh, of all of this. She, she put in a ton of work and uh, really, really uh, like brought all the loose ends and made all, communicated with everyone and made sure we we're all on task and made, and made sure this whole thing came together. So th this wouldn't have been possible without her. So really thank her a lot. Uh, really want to thank Karthik for, for helping co-organize this and, and moderating and presenting and uh, and helping with the hackathon all, all his, and providing lots of advice based on his experience with other, with, with other summer schools uh, along the way. Uh, Rich Loft provided a lot of help with getting, basically getting all the, mentoring us th through the process and providing, helping get support from the broader uh, NCAR and UCOR leadership. Our hackathon development team, I especially want, want to thank uh, Charlie, Gabrielle, Keely, and Gunther uh, for an encore, especially for uh, uh, basically coordinating throughout the week on the hackathon, answering everyone's questions, helping uh, reboot all, all the Jupyter Hub servers and and debugging everyone all the problems people are running into, updating code. Uh, again, they if, if they they hadn't put in all the work they did, we wouldn't we wouldn't have had a, a hackathon as successful as it was. So so thank you very much for that. I also like to thank all of our other hackathon development team members for all the data they contributed and and text and and everything. That it was all really helpful. Uh, again, our, our sponsors, uh, especially UCAR's Presidents Council uh, and and Bicela, they are Grimmett for providing funds for the, 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 the funding the honorarium for our speakers, uh, Amazon Web Services and Zach Flamig for providing all the computing support uh, to, to make the Jupiter Hub possible and, and allowing us to, to scale out to uh, about 300 people initially over the course of the week. Uh, the uh, Everett Joseph, uh, NCAR president and the uh, executive council for the machine learning data, data commons reinvestment funds that, that helped that basically funded the development of all these data sets. Uh, Paul Martinez, Brett Batterman, uh, Mary Andrusky, Lisa Larson, Gail Rutledge uh, for running the, running the video, running the Slido, giving us stats, being with us throughout the day, making sure we have a stable feed uh, to go, go throughout the world. Thank, uh, thank you very much for all your help. Uh, so th this is a huge team effort and couldn't have done it without, without, without everyone bringing their all. And finally, I also want to thank all, all of our 15 speakers. Uh, you're all really great presentations, really appreciate it all. Uh, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to, to put those together and, and answer all the questions from our, our, our vast audience. Uh, so with that, we're going to switch, let's see. 
uh, Encore, uh, if you you want to get started with El Nino, uh, I'll kick it off. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for having some in beautifully fast response times to any of the issues that came up. Really appreciate um, all of the help that you gave me, especially as I was developing the El Nino workbook. Yep. Th thank you very much, Encore. And yeah, we've gotten a lot of great feedback on, on your notebook uh, and, and everything. So thank you. Cool. Yeah. Well, happy to hear it. Um, so I am presenting, uh, and it's hopefully clear, um, uh, the, the results of the seasonal forecasting with an emphasis on El Nino uh, and the, the summary that we've learned from the hackathon. So for the members of the summer school who were part of a different hackathon uh, and different challenge problem, uh, just a real quick one slide overview is that El Nino is a cycle of warm and cold temperatures in the equatorial Pacific that affects seasonal weather. So it's the dominant mode of variability that has influences throughout the world. Um, and it's measured by the Nino 3.4 index shown on the bottom right, which is a rolling three month average of Pacific sea surface temperatures. In our hackathon, we were interested in forecasting El Nino, forecasting El Nino at different lead times and forecasting El Nino with different data sources and machine learning models. Um, ultimately, we ended the hackathon with a discussion about the predictability of El Nino versus that of land temperatures. So I thought I'd start with some of the most common questions that uh, I engaged with throughout the, the hackathon. But I, I did want to take a, a quick second to, to say that it was a true privilege to get to work with all of you uh, through Slack um, and uh, get, get to d debug and diagnose all of the issues. I mean, I think it's just as much fun, of course, but also informative for me. I learned some new cool tips and tricks that you can do with machine learning. And so it really is a, a pleasure and a privilege to work with all of you. And the other thing that I was really bl blown away by was how quickly and effectively hackathon participants answered each other's questions. Uh, so there was a lot of um, you know, back and forth between participants of the same team of different teams. And I think that's what makes it successful, where it's not just the organizers who are dealing with answering questions, but everyone's going through and learning it together. I think that's a secret to, uh, to a successful hackathon and that, that helps everyone get answers faster. Um, I, I tried to respond as fast as I could and I may, may have gotten some, uh, <laughs> may, may have been uh, faster than I could type there. Uh, so I think that that, that that amount of support from all the other students was phenomenal. So diving into uh, the three most common questions that I got uh, were, uh, were, were, were uh, these three. So the, the first is what considerations go into making a, a train and test set? So in climate, there are a number of important factors that we have to consider. Uh, so first is anthropogenic warming trend. So if you train on warmer years, you probably shouldn't test on colder years and vice versa. The next issue is the autocorrelation between consecutive months. So many folks reported extremely high performance, but that was just by randomly shuffling the data set, which means that you train on a month directly next to a, a month that you test on. And that means that you'll arbitrarily and um, rather uh, largely improve your performance, but it's not generalizable to months in a new year. Uh, the next is that climate models offer a new source of data, and there's uncertainty with observations pre-1979. Uh, so in this hackathon, we did work with all three types of data. We worked with old observations pre-1979, with new observations post-1979, and with uh, two, two climate model runs. The next uh, part that we discussed in the hackathon was which machine learning models leverage the spatial nature of the input. So a, a lot of discussion came around here of like, how do we format the predictors for our, for our machine learning model? Um, and the, the, the crucial difference between a convolutional neural network and a linear regression model is that a convolutional neural network takes advantage of the 2D nature of the input. So on the right here, you can see that the CNN is learning from the pixels near each other, like the groups of pixels spatially, whereas linear regression flattens all the data and then learns how to minimize the error between the forecast and the truth. 
that's a crucial difference in terms of how the data is prepared. And I think a lot of the initial bugs were people trying to run a linear regression model on spatial data, which is, 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 is a mismatch. And so I think that's one of the most important takeaways for the hackathon is that CNNs have that ability to leverage. Finally, um, there's a lot of questions and a lot of great resources shared throughout the Slack channel about how to define custom neural network architectures, um, especially time series related ones. So uh, long short-term memories, which is the diagram on the right. Um, also there are you know, PyTorch quirks about defining architectures. Uh, one is that you have to know the size of the features that are gonna be extracted in order to define a fully connected layer. Um, and that proved to be one of those nitty gritty coding challenges that often you don't foresee that being a big time sink before you start, but then when you're in the weeds and in the details, you see, uh, you see some of the challenges associated with it. Um, and I think that, that that's really exciting. That's what a hackathon allows you to do uh, uniquely is because you're, you're implementing machine learning itself, right? As um, you know, D David John started the, the hackathon with the best way to learn machine learning is to actually do it. Um, and so I was really happy to see all the discussions around defining the convolutional window and the stride uh, and, and, and dealing with the, with the results of those decisions. So on to the performance of the, of the first team. So uh, this team, team number six, applied a combination of, of models. They actually used about eight models, as you can see on the left here. And they found that the best performing model wasn't a convolutional neural network. It was an elastic net, uh, which is a, a variant of regression, uh, I believe. Uh, and so they did explore other models and other techniques. But the, the key takeaway here is that in their data processing workflow and in their set of hyperparameters, the elastic net was the most per, was the highest performing model. Uh, next, uh, another aspect of uh, this data of uh, this team's work that I was really surprised by, and I had not seen this uh, before, is that they is uh, slide point number three here. So they explored detrending the data, and they explored uh, non-detrended data, and they found that detrending the data uh, actually leads to a huge increase in performance. This also is intuitive, right? Because if we remove the trend from data, then the test set and the train set are likely going to be uh, from a similar distribution. However, if we you know, have a trend in the data, as you can see on the top plot, then a model isn't able to generalize well to a test set. This group also tried grouping the results. Um, so their point number four here is that they grouped the Nino 3.4 index into two categories, into positive and negative, and they tried exploring a classification model versus a regression model. That's a really important decision to be made with machine learning and climate, because a lot of times we're trying to predict a continuous value. For example, we're trying to predict the Nino index, or we're trying to predict temperatures. And so we could bin it in terms of hotter than average, average, lower than average, or we could try to predict the temperature itself and the performance of the neural network will vary because the loss function will vary for the, will vary for the neural network as this team demonstrated. Um, the, the really uh, major takeaway, the last takeaway from this group that I wanted to point out is the bottom right plot. So this group extended their El Nino forecasting workflow to forecast land temperatures. And because of this amazing virtual hackathon, we have people from all around the world and you know, literally multiple continents were represented here. And so you can see how the ability to forecast temperature in the Midwest of the United States in Champaign, Illinois, is quite different from the ability to forecast El Nino or even the ability to forecast um, a, a, the location at a place like Lima in Peru. So because of seasonal forecasting research, we know that uh, Lima and Peru is a lot more closely tied to El Nino than Urbana-Champaign in Illinois, which means that the root mean squared error, or RMSE, here for Lima and Peru is significantly lower than that of Illinois, which also lends us to believe that Lima has more intrinsic predictability than the Midwest. Um, and so that's, that's one of the results of, of training a neural network and testing it at different locations is that we can explore the differences in predictability at one location versus another. Uh, and I thought this group demonstrated that really beautifully using uh, three sample locations that I provided in the notebook um, in Ohio, Mexico City, and Lima, and then also the locations where they were. Cool. Uh, the next group was uh, Team 66. 
So this group uh, taught me something new. I did not know that auto sklearn and auto pytorch existed. And I think that that's some of the fun of getting to organize the, these types of hackathons as well as that uh, you, know, you have the combined brain power of every single participant. So they've found that auto sklearn and auto pytorch are two ways of training machine learning models that will improve the accuracy because they focus specifically on hyperparameter optimization. Uh, so earlier in the in the in in the hackathon and in the summer school, we we talked about how there are many hyperparameters to machine learning models. For a neural network, it's how many layers do you have, or uh, how um, wide is the convolutional filter of each layer. But even for other uh, you know regression-based models, you know, you also have hyperparameters related to how much you penalize having weights that are really large. Uh, and so these two methods, auto sklearn and auto pytorch that they found from uh, open source documentation, allow them to get much better performance. So using the two layer convolutional neural network that I defined in the notebook, they had a correlation of 0.92 and they were able to increase that to 0.96, which is pretty hard to do at a lead time of one with a limited data set, leveraging these open source tools for uh, machine learning uh, hyperparameter optimization. The next uh, area that Team 66 explored um, is they uh, is that they explored how many uh, like they, they they explored manually optimizing uh, layers themselves. So they defined a, their own neural network with one layer compared to the two layer one that I used, and then they used an automatically hyperparameter. Uh, they used Auto PyTorch to automatically find the best number of layers. And they found that uh, you know using one simple layer doesn't have as high a correlation as using two, but auto PyTorch really unlocks the capability to maximize performance with neural networks because it finds the optimal architecture. The next group was uh, Team 38, and Team 38 defined a new architecture using an LSTM. Uh, so this is an like no small feat to define a convolutional neural network and an LSTM architecture and limited span of time. Uh, and they were able to benchmark using a time series model to just using a, a, a spatial model, using a, a convolutional neural network. And in this case, they found that uh, the time series model doesn't actually improve the results, but that's an important test to do because you know ahead of time, it's a little bit hard to reason. And it's a little bit hard to develop an intuition about whether or not adding a time series will help. And so even though it, in this case it didn't, you know. One, it's a great learning experience to define that time series. And two, it's a good due diligence test. Um, it's a good test to find out uh, which model is, is the best one. And so they did find that a, a standard convolutional neural network has the best performance across uh, uh, both, both metrics of correlation and uh, RMSE. Um, then I wanted to skip to this slide here uh, because I think this slide uh, illustrates something that I, uh, I have heard discussed theoretically, but this shows it with, with real data. And that discussion is around, does a large network help? Or does a more advanced machine learning model help? So using a, a relatively simple model like linear regression or random forest, the, this group demonstrated that the correlation is somewhat consistent across various hyperparameters. So you know, the number of input time steps that you feed into the model at each location. However, using a convolutional neural network, which has probably two orders of magnitude more parameters than both of these methods, there's a lot more noise introduced into the correlation in RMSE. So for example, here you see that the correlation and uh, mean squared error plots follow a very smooth trajectory. Um, and you know, in all cases, a lead time of two months is worse than a lead time of uh, one month. But here, uh, in a convolutional neural network, there's a, a few cases where you know a lead time of one and a lead time of zero have very similar performance, or even a lead time of one has better performance, as you can see when the number of input time steps is three, and that's caused by overfitting. So because the neural network is so big and has so many parameters, it doesn't necessarily generalize as well. On the other hand, because a random forest is simpler, it doesn't have the same level of noise that's introduced. Uh, by going from one set of parameters to, to a next set of parameters. Uh, sorry, one set of hyperparameters, like the number of input time steps, uh, to, to the next set of hyperparameters. Um, on to the, the next team. 
So uh, what the next team focused on working was uh, adding a new predictor. I've never tried this test before, and I actually I hadn't even heard of warm water volume as a as a predictor before uh, the b b before this team discussed it with me in the in the in their team channel. Uh, but they found that adding more data was a good way to increase the forecasting capability of their model. Uh, and you know that really goes back to the first common question that I mentioned, which is like, how do you define the best data set? So you know, one option is get more data. So in you know the, the starting data set was surface temperature. Uh, you could get more data of simulated surface temperature from GCMs, and that didn't improve as much as getting better data, getting different types of data. Which is in this case, they added a whole new field and. They did all the downloading and pre-processing themselves because uh, this this data wasn't available on the on the portal for for data downloads, and their warm water volume increased the predictability and the predictive power of their machine learning models um, uh, across the board, uh, and that's highlighted by their first bullet point at the bottom, which is that uh, warm water volume and sea surface temperature increases the model predictability compared to just sea surface temperature. Uh, onto the the next team. Uh, so this team uh, was in particular uh, really active in responding to the the larger channels on El Nino um, and that uh, the, the the broader El Nino channel. And I think that you know if I could give uh, like a a service over self shout out, uh, it would be to a lot of the members of this team because not only do they work a lot with themselves, but they responded to the broader questions. Um, Andre Jenny particularly responded to a lot of the broader questions that everyone had throughout the entire hackathon, but all 100 or so people who worked on this. So uh, these people looked at, uh, sorry, this team looked at two broad categories of uh, experiments. The first was in the machine learning method, and the second is in the machine learning data. So they compared training on 200 years of simulated data to training on observed data, and they compared a random forest to uh, a CNN uh, to uh, um, to a, a RID regression, um, and they they <laughs> they found that some models didn't perform well. For example, a random forest model didn't perform as well as a as a two layer CNN, even though the two layer CNN was trained on you know simulated data. So the, that model was able to learn more from less realistic data than a model trained on observations was able to learn from from real data. Uh, so one of the one of the lessons that they uh, that they learned uh, in, in particular was to to be careful of overfitting and underfitting. So overfitting occurs when the test loss is significantly higher than the train loss. And their uh, loss curve on the bottom right here illustrates that because their test loss is about, you know, an order of magnitude higher than their train loss. And to some extent, there's, there's going to be a distinction. Uh, the, the performance on the training set will probably always be a little bit better than the performance on the test set with most real data sets because the, the model has seen the train set before. But in this case, the, the, dis, the distinction was large. You know, their, their train loss was around 0 0.01, 0 0.02, whereas their test loss was, was up to 0.2. Um, going to the, the next team, which was uh, team 13, uh, this team compared looking at older data to looking at newer data. So before 1979, a lot of our observations of sea surface temperature uh, weren't, uh, and rather temperature as a whole, weren't as good because of uh, the, you know, the, the, the lack of as many uh, uh, measurement tool. So we, there wasn't as active a satellite presence before 1979. Um, but after 1979, because of the increase in data density from satellite observations, but also just an increase in the number of automated weather stations and buoys on the ocean, uh, it's generally considered that that newer data is more reliable. And so they learned that training on data prior to 1979 degraded the quality of the prediction. Once again, this ties back to the first question. What should be the train years and what should be the test years? In this very uneven uh, playing field and topography of all sorts of different climate models and different climate data sets available, even observations aren't always on the same field because observations before 1979, going back to 1880, uh, the data set supported, weren't as good as the newer, observation, uh, newer observations. Um, uh, and then he, he, here they included that uh, data density uh, uh, 
graph, right? So the, the number of uh, ship-based observations increased heavily uh, in, the, in the 2000s. Um, the, the next lesson that they learned was uh, similar to uh, the first, uh, rather the second group I presented on, which was on hyperparameter tuning. Uh, they also focused on using hyperparameters to have the ideal balance between train loss and test loss. So a deeper neural network probably will make your train loss go down, but you don't want to make your train loss go down so far that your model overfits and is no longer generalizable to the test set. Uh, going on to the, the next team, which was uh, team, team 20. Uh, this team uh, tried a, a variety of different models, uh, which was you know, encouraged in, in the notebook. They tried uh, convolutional neural networks, random forests, and linear regression, all of which uh, can be defined but tuned by the, the packages and the, the starter code that the notebook has. But they, compared to some of the, the plots that I've shown earlier, focused on a larger lead time. They were working at a lead time of five months. Uh, and so, you know, this, this naturally means that it's a, it's a harder forecasting task than you know, forecasting one month ahead of time. Uh, and so their, their visualization of the data shows that the ground truth, which is the, the dark blue line, um, was reasonably matched by almost all the models, but uh, you know, not the linear regression here in 2015. But I think one thing that you can see is that the, the orange line from the convolutional neural network does stay close to the observed um, pretty, pr pretty consistently. Uh, and so they, you know, they reported a, a correlation of 0 0.78. The other task that this group did specifically that I think um, really, yeah, like really explored one of the fundamental parts of machine learning is that they tried ensembling different methods. So it's unclear if, you know, one method alone is going to have the best forecast, or if you combine all of the methods uh, that, that the package and the, the tool set use, and then use that to come up with the forecast. And so here they found that an ensemble of all of these machine learning models doesn't actually perform as well as the CNN. Uh, but I think that there's room to explore that even further. So what if we take a weighted average of these machine learning models? Or what if we just prune it and take the top two or three? Um, and I, I had discussions with some of these team members about ways to continue exploring that after the hackathon ends. Uh, one thing is that uh, you know, they found that larger lead times, so five months, uh, is that CNNs performed better than random forests and linear regression. And that makes intuitive sense because a CNN model is the deepest, it's the most parameterized, and it's the most complicated. So it should be the best at the hardest task, right? The most complicated task with the most complicated relationship, which was a five month lead time. On the other hand, at a one month lead time, a random forest, which is simpler, uh, was able to, to perform similarly well to a, to a CNN. Um, the next thing that this group explored was uh, pre-processing the data. So they used uh, PCA, which stands for Principal Component Analysis. And that's a way of making the input data simpler. So they, uh, you know, in the notebook uh, explains what that means in more <laughs> in, you know, in, in more, in more depth. Uh, I, I didn't do justice to PCA there by just saying it makes the data simpler, but it, it reduces the dimensionality of the data such that machine learning models might be able to learn from it better. Uh, and so they tried exploring a different number of principal component analysis, and they did, you know, of their own volition and of their own initiative, uh, did a test where they tried to evaluate how the number of principal components affects the skill. And really, you can see that, you know, if you have five principal components, so you're reducing the data to five vectors, five modes of variability that explain uh, how the data is behaving, that is enough to maximize your skill. Um, adding many more principal components, like 20, 30, 35 principal components, doesn't improve the performance of the model um, uh, at, at this lead time. Uh, and another you know, interesting relationship between this advantage, uh, between this experiment and the way El Nino is traditionally uh, studied, is that El Nino is often thought to be one of these principal components, possibly the most dominant one on seasonal time scales. Or, maybe the second most dom dominant one if we're looking at a long-term trend uh, with anthropogenic warming. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, another principal component is the seasonal cycle. So the fact that it gets hotter in summer and colder in winter is one thing that explore, it's one way that traditional machine learning uh, applies to traditional climate science and the way that we think about uh, pre-processing our data and the way that we know the climate system operates with an El Nino oscillation with a seasonal cycle. 
Uh, the next team was uh, Team 24, uh, and they uh, were focused on um, evaluating models at different lead times. Uh, so they not only looked at how well does each model perform, but it's how well does each model perform at a lead time of one month, two months, three months, all the way up to five months. Um, and on their next slide here, uh, they explored that question in the context of subsetting a region. So on the left here, they include the global reanalysis data set. So they're including all of the global sea surface temperature observations. And on the right, they only look at equatorial Pacific observation. So in particular, they subset out uh, the region that isn't near the equator in, in the Pacific. And they use that from, uh, from the, uh, to, to form the basis of their machine learning model. Uh, and so you know, what, one of their findings that I thought was really well put and really uh, well uh, explained is that data from the rest of the world adds value, but it also adds noise. And that's in line, like no observation that we have of the world is perfect. There's always noise in every single one of our observations. But sometimes even that observation, even though it's noisy, still adds to the predictive power of the model because it's more data about how the climate is behaving. Uh, and so, you know, they found that just using the equator, the skill was very low, like almost as bad as chance, really. It's like the, the correlation was 0 0.34. But adding global data did improve the, the, the performance of the model tremendously. Um, so they uh, use this to select the best performing model. So as discussed previously, they decided to use the entire global field as opposed to a subset, a specific region in the Pacific. Um, and then they explored different ways of training a neural network. So uh, you know, one option is to use uh, an, opt, uh, an optimizer called the uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent and another is to use a different optimization technique and they tried out multiple ones and selected the one that has the best performance. Um, the, the next team was uh, team 41. So this team worked on making the convolutional neural network code more modular and more flexible. So they tried to accommodate arbitrary input sizes whereas the you know the, the network that I defined only used uh, and only worked with one input size, uh, one degree by one degree grid of latitude by longitude. Um, and so uh, some of the visualizations that they included were um, using a, a, a trained test loss curve as we've seen earlier. But what this group also did is they tried seeing how the trained test uh, loss curve varies. So um, when you're training a neural network, uh, you keep track of the loss at each step. But some neural networks use a higher learning rate and some are trained with a lower learning rate. So on the top here, they use the higher learning rate. I think that it was a 10 to the power of negative four. And that in induces a lot of noise in the neural network training. And you can see that by the, you know, the network loss going up at some points. Uh, in general, you'd want the loss to be continuously going downwards. But then they also tried it making that uh, learning rate lower. So when you have a lower learning rate at each step, you're making a smaller change. And that's reflected by the fact that there's less noise now because they're not making as big of a change from epoch to epoch. So at the bottom, you can see uh, at the bottom right, you can see how the loss really, uh, really declines comparatively and more smoothly to, to, to using a larger, a larger neural network curve, larger neural network learning rate. The next model uh, that Team 60 used was also a, um, a standard convolutional neural network, but they tried yet a different learning rate. Uh, so they explored the default learning rate provided in the notebook and they tried other options. And this one uh, per performed the best. It had the, the highest performing model, uh, which was uh, 0 0.00015. Uh, and from, uh, from discussions with them on, on, the, on the Slack group, it, it does also seem like you have to just try many different learning rates and see see what sticks, see what uh, see what performs the best. Um, and th th there isn't really a lot of intuition behind what the best learning rate would be. Uh, and it it's better to do a, a more guess and check approach. Um, and they uh, they they explored testing multiple kinds of observations. So they used sea surface temperatures, which are more directly related to El Nino, but they also used two meter temperature. Um, and the difference between these two data sets is really interesting. So sea surface temperatures only provide measures of the sea, of the, of, of the oceans, but re, uh, two meter temperature also includes land. 
So sea surface temperature did better than two meter temperature because sea surface temperature is directly related to the Nino 3.4 index. On the other hand, two meter temperature includes more data points because it also includes values for lands. And so here they found that it's better to use data that's directly related to the target, which is the Nino 3.4 index, than it is to use all of the land data um, that's, that, that's available. And you know, the, the RMSCs reflect that. Uh, the, the next team here was uh, uh, team 50. So here they uh, tried a, a random forest with, with 20 branches on uh, lead time of one, and they tried a, a two layer convolutional neural network and found that the, the neural network outperforms the random forest. Uh, but then they extended that to uh, a lead time of five. And here, is some, here are some results that I found surprising that I didn't foresee happening which is that when you trade on an observational data set, which is smaller, the performance is better than when you trade on a climate model data set, which is much larger. So this CNRM simulation has about 400 usable years. And uh, you know, assuming that they use most of those years, more data doesn't necessarily mean better performance. Here they had more data, but because the data wasn't as high quality as the observational data set, um, you know, observations are our best estimate of of the climate. That means that the observational data set uh, was a better training source for, for, for their model. So the takeaway is more data doesn't mean a better model. Um, going on to the, the next team, which had uh, the nicest uh, you, uh, you know, user slide design, user interface for their slides, um, and, and also really covered some um, interesting scientific ground in just two days because they switched from another from another notebook. Uh, they uh, focused on classifying and predicting El Nino and La Nina as everyone else did. But one thing that is uh, interesting about their findings is that they, compared to what most of the other groups did, didn't divide the data into positive, El Ni positive Nino 3.4 values and negative Nino 3.4 values. They did a more subtle, a more nuanced, and ultimately, I believe, a more accurate thing which is that they divided it into El Nino, La Nina, and neutral. So it's not just drawing a line at zero, but it's binning it with an, a, a whole new additional bin, with a, with a bin of neutral uh, for values that are close to zero. And here they found uh, that that leads to interesting distinctions between how the model performs at each different time step. Wanted to, to highlight that, uh, you know, the, for, for, for values of El Nino, um, their prediction performance wasn't as good as it was for values for La Nina and for, for the neutral values. Uh, and so that, that, that's a really important test that you can do with machine learning is if you bin it, how do your bins matter? Like where do you draw the line between one bin and another bin and how does that affect your overall performance? Um, and that's something that this analysis uniquely, uh, uniquely offers. <laughs> Uh, then they explored uh, what they called the model zoo, which is uh, the, the, the full space, the full options of models that work for this task. So, you know, you can use convolutional neural networks, you can use uh, random forests, you can use other types of regression. Uh, and that uh, is, is uh, what they focus on comparing and uh, uh, comparing and contrasting. Uh, and, you know, what they want to do next is to look into more interpretability. Uh, so, for example, why is the neural network making the prediction it is? And then you can compare that to uh, a neural network trained on observational data, to a neural network trained on CNRM data, to an, uh, which is one climate model, to a neural network trained on um, MPI data, which is a third model. Uh, and I, I, I think that if there was a, you know, a, a next step for the hackathon to, to explore, it would be this question. It would be interpretability and, and visualization. Um, Oh, thank you for this opportunity. They're very welcome. Uh, moving on to uh, Team 71, which was uh, also looking primarily at the, the Nino forecasting regime. Uh, so they did, a, I would say, probably the most rigorous benchmarking of any team of uh, how does one model perform to another model, as you can see uh, in, in, in this plot. So uh, each, each model performance uh, is its own unique color or uh, its own unique line. And uh, one thing that's really interesting and provoked a, a great discussion on Slack was about this jump at about a lead time of 25 for multiple linear regression. It's like, why 
is that happening? Like, why is the room mean squared error going from like 1.5 and 2, which is already really high, to 4.5? And I think the conclusion of this discussion is that for lead times greater than, say, you know, 10 months, the forecast is basically random. Like the, the ability to forecast is essentially random chance. So the, uh, um, the root mean squared error spiking at around 25 months is likely due to, to overfitting, that the multiple linear regression model is really overfit to some aspect of noise in its training data set. And that means that it's in its test data set, its root mean squared error is gonna be extremely high because it's not actually learning the right features that go into making an El Nino forecast. It's learned noise. On the other hand, this didn't happen for any of the other models, showing that the other models are slightly less susceptible to this type of um, overfitting to a specific train set behavior. Um, so uh, this group uh, on the bottom right uh, binned their predictions, and then they, they showed a plot of, uh, of the bins. And they show that most of the time when you bin uh, the prediction into positive and negative, the, the neural network matches what the expected label is going to be. Um, they also uh, explored using a smaller learning rate, um, as discussed earlier, and uh, they independently verified the other team's conclusion that a smaller learning rate leads to a more smooth train and test loss curve. And finally, uh, team 20. Uh, so team, uh, this is the, the last uh, El, El Nino team, and uh, th this team explored using longer training schemes. So they explored training for 40 epochs, as opposed to some of the other networks that were defined that were only trained for 10 epochs, um, and tried to see how that would affect the performance. Um, and in general, I think it's fair to say that the conclusion was that the, the performance was comparable, meaning that the, the convolutional neural network um, wasn't getting much more by training for an extra um, amount of time. Uh, one thing that's uh, important here is that they also verify the conclusion that other teams looked at, which is that training on older data from 1900 to 1930 does not lead to a model that performs as well as training on newer data from uh, 1975 to, to 2005. The, the performance on the validation set improves significantly. So with that uh, being said, and with that concluding, um, uh, that summarizes what everyone had done uh, over the course of one week. And this was, uh, I just want to emphasize, this notebook was hard. Like it, there's a lot of concepts being thrown about uh, bias and variance trade-offs and about training sets versus test sets. Uh, just really wanted to iterate that it was a true pleasure and a privilege to get to, to work with all of you. And I, I hope we get to, we get to do it again. David, do you want to, uh, David John, do you want to take it from, from here for going into the break and into the next ones? I see on the chat here that there's a, a Slido, uh, Slido question, which is uh, what the five month skill is of the CNRM. So to pro provide a, a little bit more background on this question, uh, CNRM is a climate model. And one of the questions that the notebook produces and poses is what is the difference between training on a climate model like CNRM and observational data? So this question from uh, ben, ben C about the five month skill forecast on CNRM, the best that I saw in this specific task was a correlation of about 0.71 on uh, anomalized data. But there are two uh, other things to consider here, which is that uh, there, the, the first is that there was a recent paper published in Nature um, by, uh, uh, by Ham et al. Um, and what they found is that training on uh, many more 
simulation. So the full CMIP5 suite of simulations led to an even better performance. Uh, so I, I don't remember what their correlation skill was exactly, but uh, that that notebook is linked to in the uh, in that paper is linked to in the notebook, and uh, you can really just uh, see that their the correlation skill that they got was above 0 0.85 for a five month lead time training on data sets. Would a summary of all the teams for each of the problems be made available? Uh, we will make available uh, some of the recommended answers. Um, I don't know that we will, uh, what, we'll, what we'll try to do is like combine all of the insights gained from all of the teams um, into, uh, into a notebook, but I, I, I don't know if we'll make it specific team by team what each team did. We'll, we'll combine the solutions and uh, you know, the, the best practices that everyone came together, came up with together at the end. Great, thank you all for your questions. Maybe we should take a short break until um, 2.50 and then Gabrielle will come on and present the other problem. So we'll see you back in five minutes. Hello.
All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, sorry for the little interruption there to, to answer people's questions. We will try to share the, the, all the presentation slides, uh, post them online and with recordings at, afterward. Uh, so you can go through, may have to do, do another editing pass, but we'll, we'll make sure they're all shared. Uh, our next uh, speaker in the uh, discussion is, uh, is going, our next problem is going to be on the holodeck problem. Uh, this will be, the presentation will be led by Gabrielle Gantos. Uh, she is currently, she's an associate scientist uh, too at, at NCAR in the IML group uh, and, and worked a lot on, on bringing this uh, problem together and helping out throughout the week on it. So. Uh, take it away, Gabrielle. Hey. Hi, everybody. Um, can you see me? Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Okay, uh, great. Can you, can you go ahead and share your screen? I can absolutely do that. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so just to reiterate the problem again for people who perhaps didn't hear it on Monday or who haven't been working on this problem all week. Um, the holodeck problem and, um, is attempting to learn from 2D image inputs the location and diameter of particles as measured by the holographic detector for clouds or a holodeck. Um, so holodeck is an airborne instrument that measures liquid droplets and ice crystals and natural clouds. Um, you can see this bright blue cylinder or not cylinder but um, rectangle, 3D rectangle um, in the picture below. Um, and what you get as a result of this measurement is a um, huge amount of data um, that contains information about image, about particles, about over a hundred, a thousand particles per hologram. Um, and in attempting to analyze this data, over two million core hours per project can be used. So what machine learning is attempting to do with this problem is more quickly learn the um, 3D position of the particle as well as the diameter of every particle within that hologram. Um, so what we do for this project is we, instead of using realistic data, we use synthetic data to attempt to simplify the problem. Um, only water droplets are used, not um, not ice crystals. Um, the droplets are only circular. Um, and then the hologram images are grayscale only. Um, so the data set contains inputs that are images and the predicted outputs or true outputs are XYZ positions and diameters for every hologram. And um, we have two different difficulty levels for this problem. And some of our groups presented um, data for the one particle hologram data set and one for the three uh, particle per hologram data set. And both approaches are very interesting. Um, I, I think that the fact that people were able to make progress in both of these um, data sets is incredibly um, exciting and a testament to how hard everybody worked this week. Um, and I also, I guess, need to back up and say that I had a lot of fun working with everybody and I really appreciate how much everybody stuck with the problem and with the memory issues in this um, in this project. Um, they were realistic as um, as DJ mentioned in his introduction to this um, uh, hour in that occasionally, you know, the, not occasionally, very often, um, in um, working within your memory um, or uh, disk space limitations is is a huge issue for um, for machine learning scientists and for data scientists. So, anyways, um, I really appreciate everybody that worked hard on this problem, and thank you for sticking with it um, for this week. Okay. So um, we had two baseline models, and the 
the, the single particle baseline model was a very straightforward um, 2D CNN, as was the three particle baseline model. Um, for the single particle baseline model, the um, mean absolute errors given the, which I re-ran given the data limitations, um, are, are described below. Um, so the, um, the X, Y, Z, and D errors were relatively, you know, um, relatively uh, high still. And so we were hoping that one of the groups would be able to, um, to learn a bit more on that one particle per hologram data set than we were. For the three particle data set, um, instead of using mean absolute error, because we were attempting to predict or learn the per hologram particle mass distribution along the z-axis, we use the ranked probability score, um, which as you can see was learning basically an average response um, in our basic 2D convolutional neural network model. Okay, so let's move on to the first team, team 11. Yeah, so, really quick. Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Would you mind turning your video, like your webcam off? Because you're just frozen and I think it'll help with the bandwidth. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry. This is my first time doing this. I'm not an That's expert. Okay, thank okay. You. okay, let me know if that's not better. Much better. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, all right, so for Team 11, Team 11 tried PCA and logistic regression, the Hoff search algorithm uh, compared to the benchmark model, a modified benchmark model, and the ResNet, and then began the process of implementing YOLO, which is fantastic. Um, so let's go on to their results here. Okay, you can see that the ResNet performed much better than the benchmark, which is fantastic. Um, sorry, I forgot to note that they were working on the one particle problem um, and outperforms the baseline model by huge amounts, which is amazing, and um, was not using the full data set. I mean, so for this problem, we started out with huge amounts of data and continued to decrease it as we were running into more and more memory issues. So the fact that all of these teams are able to work within these constraints is fantastic. Um, so challenges that Team 11 faced were getting the environment to work, um, which makes sense. I, I know that was a, an issue for everybody in the challenge, um, the kernels freezing up or, or needing to be restarted. Um, Hyperparameter tuning is very difficult, of course, especially when you only have the single server that you're working on. and um, preparing input data sets for different kinds of algorithms is very difficult. Yeah, um, that can be one of the more challenging aspects. Um, you know, as people have mentioned in various discussions throughout the week, um, data processing and uh, understanding your data and visualizations, that can be um, a huge percentage of your work. Um, and especially if you're trying to switch very quickly w between different kinds of models and um, and make sure that, you know, that you're keeping the integrity of the data uh, whole, then that can be an issue. Okay, so um, this is Team 11's YOLO um, approach, which they weren't able to completely implement, but they seem to have gotten pretty far. Um, and what they, what they were working on is using a 30 by 20 slide window and then convolving. Um, and the tricky part to this, of course, is implementing the loss function and then recreating training labels for all of the, um, for the entire data set, which of course is very challenging. Um, and then of course the memory issue again. So good job. Um, so let's move on to team 19. Um, team 19 worked with a lot of different um, um, methods for decreasing dimensionality, um, which were very interesting and visualized a lot of image processing um, uh, um, methodologies. So at the top 
here they visualize the X and Y gradients in the hologram, which is fantastic. Um, and then in the bottom have applied a binary filter um, rather than um, maintaining the full range of zero to 255. Um, and then on the bottom here, on the bottom right, they have visualized the max and min distributions for, um, for a single particle hologram. So the methods they attempted were linear regression, random forest, gradient boosting regressor, and CNN, of course. Okay, so um, these were the um, visualizations of the variance and the X and Y gradients, which is a really interesting um, uh, approach to visualizing um, data dimensionality reduction. Um, you can see here that um, that um, the in the results, this has led to increases in the mean square error. I'm sorry, decreases in the mean square error and allows for um, more simple methods to work well. Um, so lessons learned. Uh, model interpretability helps find errors in feature extraction, intentionally extracting features from holograms, um, boosted predictions, and the shallow methods tested. So you can use more simple models. And then um, occasionally uh, deep learning methods can be challenging, especially given uh, memory and disk constraints. Okay, so team 26 worked on the three particle problem, which is predicting the mean relative mass by on the z-axis from the um, from the camera perspective. Um, and they were able to make an improvement on the uh, ranked probability scale score, which is fantastic. So uh, Team 26 compared the baseline model to the um, to various implementations of CNNs. Um, and you can see here that um, filter, uh, changing the um, filter and batch size had the most impact and led to the best results. Um, so for the one particle model, um, uh, the various scalars were attempted and um, and um, the uh, robust scalar was found to do the best for all of the metrics. Um, and a really interesting example is that or a really interesting result is that it takes only about 200 particles to converge to um, the ultimate answer, which is, you know, would decrease a lot of training time if you're attempting to do this on um, on an online basis or um, yeah. So um, I think I think that this team also ran into the issue of attempting to um, find the optimal combination of hyperparameters given the um, given the challenges of running this data and these models over a single server and um, you know, not as much perhaps GPU and memory power as they would have liked. Okay, so team 35. Uh, so uh, team 35 worked on the single particle hologram. Um, they attempted to change the CNN kernels to a non-square shape, attempted to alter the batch size, number of training epochs, and activation functions. Um, they were not able to improve the model noticeably, um, and what they found was that learning Keras was a bit more difficult than, um, than they had anticipated. Um, so, you know, I, I think that the, the fact that you were able to get, uh, make modifications and interpret them is fantastic. Um, and it's completely understandable that the training time for the model was 
you know, kind of halting progress and, and, and waiting to see results, um, you know, was challenging in the end. Um, but yeah. Okay, so for Team 40, Team 40 worked on a single particle holodeck data set, um, and they were able to implement a ResNet similar to um, an earlier team. Um, they were able to decrease the uh, mean average error slightly, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, we're only able to fit in two epochs with the time constraints, but that's OK. Um, so uh, the lessons learned from Team 40 are that hyperparameters can make or break a model. Um, more complex models may increase accuracy given time and GPUs, absolutely and then that low loss doesn't imply high accuracy. And that's a really important uh, observation because a lot of people initially tr using machine learning techniques will point to their loss and assume that that's, um, that, that decrease is, is um, an indication of, of, um, of success, but you need to make sure you're evaluating using the proper metrics. Um, Okay, and so yeah, more particles, more problems, absolutely. Um, the single, single particle holodeck data set is a much more, um, much more easy to interpret model and image on its own. Um, the interference patterns in a three particle data set are very difficult to understand and to model. And um, it's great that you guys were able to implement a ResNet at all. So good job. Okay, so Team 47. Team 47 did downscaling to reduce the dimensionality. Um, and uh, it seems like the uh, local mean downscaling that you did was pretty amazing um, and decreases the load on the model significantly. So let's look at some results. Um, so the baseline here is in blue, and then the best performing um, model was the CNN in purple. So um, uh, you can see that um, for a single particle prediction, um, Team 47 got pretty close to the actual truth value, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, and given the, uh, the number of particles in the data set, you guys did a great job. Um, and yeah, let's see here. Um, the lessons learned and challenges are were understandably um, what what each of the individual layers in the CNN are actually doing, what mathematical, you know, um, function is occurring in each of those layers and that is very understandable that is very difficult uh, to visualize or understand conceptually um, but overall you guys did a great job and you we were able to implement many different um, models and test test them out which is impressive on its own so yeah good job Okay, so Team 49 did a lot of work with dimensionality reduction. They focused on the single particle problem um, and attempted to learn to use first um, very simple models and beat the baseline score and then to tune neural networks. Um, so uh, the challenge was obviously um, the high dimensionality of the input data and um, in order to uh, subvert that challenge, uh, Team 49 attempted to implement three dimensionality reduction methods. So the first is um, averaging over the X or Y dimension when training for Y or X. So um, it, um, this completely uh, makes uh, a ton of sense. And um, of course, it didn't work as well for diameter prediction. Um, but your next dimensionality reduction 
uh, method, it worked very well for diameter prediction. So you use downsizing and use a factor of four to uh, downsize the pixels in an image. Um, and your question here, might improving diameter and Z predictions, if we if we center the image using X and Y predictions, that might be a great idea. You could do a serial um, prediction for each of the dimensions that you're attempting to predict. Um, and then PCA, you retain 900 components, 80% cumulative variance, um, combined with random forest work best for diameter prediction. So um, that's pretty fantastic. Let's take a look at the results here. So the baseline CNN with 6,000 training images um, had the uh, errors of 300, 255,000, and 15. And with your best simple models, um, uh, you were able to, and 6,000 images, you were able to get that down to 35, 24, and n nothing reported for diameter, but four, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, that's really interesting results. And then if you train with a full 15,000, images then you get much better results in both in both categories um, but yeah I know that wasn't always possible because of memory so um, your much faster much more simple models were able to train on 6,000 images and perform relatively well which is fantastic um, and you were able to almost compare to the 15,000 sample size, which is, you know, uh, really fantastic and a great result. So good job. Um, okay, so uh, let's see here. Sorry, did I? Okay. Um, so Team 49 still worked on convolutional neural network for, um, and, uh, Let's see here, sorry. Lessons learned, convolutional neural network and dense neural network take a long time to run. Um, there do seem to be unlimited po uh, possibilities to reduce dimensionality and tune the model hyperparameters. Absolutely, this is not a one and done process. And I think that's something that hopefully everybody at the hackathon um, who's a little bit newer to machine learning comes away with. Um, there's not, uh, there's not a, a, a single right answer all of the time. There's improvements and incremental improvements occasionally. And then um, definitely understanding the underlying data goes a long way in designing the proper method. Absolutely. Um, I mean, if you can understand what each, the amount of information each pixel is giving you, then you can um, take advantage of that and harness that information as as many of these groups did throughout the process. Um, yeah, and getting familiar with the data set, I, I feel like is half of the problem in machine learning problems. Um, and so emphasizing that as a learning um, lesson is, is really important and good job guys. Um, okay. So I think that's about all I have. I'm not sure if we want to switch over to um, microphysics or if we want to take a 10 minute break as we were supposed to. Uh, we could probably just go ahead and take the 10 minute break now and then and then come back. OK, at, sounds good. At 3 five and, 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 and do microphysics um, so, so you don't have to talking uh, so yep we'll be we'll be back in 10 minutes uh, 325 uh, to, 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 to finish off everything else uh, if you have questions feel free to put them in the slack and the uh, or in the slido we're still we're still monitoring that uh, also uh, after this we'll the slack will keep open uh, the, the github page for the hackathon also please please feel free to submit issues on there uh, and we'll we get notifications email notifications on that so we'll be able to to also respond to any further questions uh, through 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 the github page
So I'll, I'll post a link to that on the on the Slido for everyone.
All right, we're going to we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back from the break. Uh, we're, we're now going to jump into the, the microphysics uh, hackathon presentations. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So uh, kind of a quick overview of the, the microphysics problem. Uh, this is a uh, machine physics simulation, uh, parameterization simulation, um, similar to some of the ones we saw present uh, this week by uh, Mike Pritchard and Pierre Gentine. Except in this case, we're instead of trying to emulate all of the all of the grid physics in the model, we're we're just focusing on one small process, but one that pretty important one. Uh, in this case, this is the, the warm rain formation process, which is critical, especially for climate prediction, also weather prediction. Uh, the, the, why it's a big sensitivity is because it models how cloud water, rain water, uh, and there's multiple processes that, that interact with this, basically cloud droplets colliding with each other to form a raindrop or raindrops colliding with cloud droplets or raindrops colliding with other raindrops. Uh, basically all of these can change the distribution of cloud and rain droplet particles uh, and have a lot, there's a lot of complex interaction on in this process. In our current uh, weather and climate model, these interactions are parameterized with relatively simple bulk polarization scheme where you use one or two, one to three variables to, to model a, a for gamma like distribution that um, uh, basically describes how, like for given diameter, how many particles of that di diameter exists of a certain type. Uh, the downside is that it, it require a lot of approximations of all the interactions and uh, the limited flexibility means that, that yeah, it, it will affect the behavior of the clouds. Uh, a more flexible way to do this is what's, what's called a bin microphysics scheme, where you explicitly simulate the the interactions between so, of different sizes uh, uh, by binning binning them into certain size groups. Uh, so this is more flexible, but it's also a lot more intensive and intensive to run. So in practice, it's usually only done very small scale runs. But with machine, a machine learning emulator, we might be able to emulate this process from a bin scheme and then plug it into a bulk scheme and run nearly at the same speed and thus be able to run longer climate simulations and, and model this impact. Uh, so, so for this particular problem, we, we gave everyone uh, uh, five very, we have five main primary input variables. There's a, a few other ones that we also we also provided that describe the different inputs to the microphysics scheme, uh, and then you're trying to predict the the tendencies in the in, in the microphysics every grid point. So the tendency being the time, the how much it should change based off of the the, the those inputs. So we have uh, the QR, NR, and NC tendencies, which you can see below. Um, the baseline approach is something we've implemented at, uh, actually uh, as part of, part of another research project uh, where we have a collection of neural networks that each try to model first whether the ten each tendency is going to be non-zero and then if it's non-zero model the the magnitude of that tendency. Uh, and we have some preliminary results shown here. Uh, um, based on these statistics, what, what you have to be in there. And, and, and so it was a pretty challenging baseline uh, to be. Uh, the problem is also Tricky because it's um, of its conditional nature. Uh, you have very exponentially distributed variables. You have uh, they don't they aren't running. It's not a continuous value everywhere. There's a lot, there's a lot of zeros basically because this only runs within clouds in the model. Uh, so so it's it's a little bit different from some some of the other problems in that regard. Um, we had a, a lot of different solutions and, uh, and we'll we'll kind of go through what what people did and where they went well. We also did have some have some struggles, uh, and partially because there uh, lack of some clarification on the problem. Uh, some people did try to do deep learning and 
it, unfortunately, the deep learning is not the most ideal solution for this particular problem because of the, the kind of underlying physics of it. While it might be possible for, for a deep learning solution to provide some improvements, it's, it's going to be a lot harder to implement compared with some of the other challenges. So I, I apologize for that, for, for those who did, who did try to do that. Uh, yeah, but that's something we definitely work on clarifying for, for next time. Uh, but we, a number of the teams did get some interesting results, so we'll kind of go through what, what, what they were what, what what they were able to find. Uh, so we'll start with team three. Uh, they they applied uh, linear regression, random forest and networks. Uh, they also created a correlation plot here for inputs. Uh, and what, what they found, so this is in the kind of scaled domain, uh, since the statistics will be easier to calculate. Uh, for the R squared R MSC, we're getting uh, uh, 0 0.997, 0 0.93. So a little worse than the baseline, but still, it was still good. Um, and they also did not, not do much hyperlining, but we're still, still able to get uh, fairly good results. There are lessons learned and challenges where having a very basic problem rain formation processes was the biggest challenge. Yeah, it's def definitely is a more specialized uh, challenge. It has a bit more of a learning curve compared to some of the other problems. Uh, and they also mentioned that there, there were challenges the learning curve with the Python code and the machine learning. Uh, so, so they definitely ran into some issues there. Uh, we do appreciate. I do appreciate that they, that they stick with it and and produced results and and did work work all the way through and, and and were able to implement multiple machine learning methods. So 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 thank you, Team Three. Uh, team Twelve uh, uh, posted a number of, of less challenges. First, uh, hyperparameter tuning is hard. Yes, it is. It is extremely hard. Uh, something because it's computationally intensive and. And there's a lot of hyperparameters. It, it it can it can take a while, and, uh, and given the time constraints, the, the computational constraints of the hackathon, that made made even harder. Uh, the team also did not have anyone with an ML experience, so they they did a lot of flailing. I do appreciate them sticking through with it, though. Uh, um, there are significant efforts just made to improve the efficiency of the scaling methods by separating the read and transform steps. Uh, they discovered that the results were largely insensitive to the choice of scalar, which differs from the holodeck problem where they did find the, the choice of scalar made a big difference. Uh, that's one of the challenges we face with machine learning problems is that some, like, while there are some things that generalize across lots of different problems, there are others that are much more specific and why they might work or why they might not work because very, some very, some problems have very kind of, yeah, more continuous distributions of other have a lot more conditional uh, and all of these really affects like how one goes about learning it. Uh, they, they did implement random forest on this problem. They found that the results were close to the baseline model but still fell below it. Random forest is maybe not always the best choice after all. And now performing the baseline model seems to be, uh, yeah, the baseline in this case was, has, was tuned a fair bit over a much longer period of time. So it's, it's going to be a harder one to beat than some of the other ones we had. Uh, they tested some additional uh, like Hamming loss on the classification, which represents the fraction of labels that are incorrectly predicted between zero and one. They also looked at the zero one loss classification or returns a number of misclassifications. Um, they figured out that these two were equivalent to each other. I also looked at the mean squared error and their scoring as mean absolute error, but the mean squared error emphasizes outliers and extreme more. So yeah, it, it is it is good to calculate both if you can and see which one does work better. Uh, oh, uh, thank you, team, uh, team 12. Uh, team 15, uh, they, 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 they took quite a few different methods of RNN, a PinesNet, and a Kara sequential model. Uh, and show some of the distributions of the data here. Uh, you know, the confusion matrix for the dense color, and they use the seaborne heat map to kind of show some of these results here. Um, and and they, like on the classification, looks like they did quite well. I, hard, hard to translate the from the absolute values to the some of the other scores off the top of my head, but the, these do these do look promising. Um, they focused on interpretability. There's diff they, again, it was difficult to work and understand work with the existing code base and missing understanding of the problem itself. 
Like your physics data is incomplete, unable to use time sequences for R and Ns. Yeah, the uh, yeah with this particular problem, the we we were saving out the data every hundred hours. So so doing a, an R and N on this one, all possible. And if you have if you have the the full like every time step climate output is going to be a lot harder on this. Uh, Team forty six uh, also tried some a mix of dimensionality reduction methods and random forest and DNN uh, for, for three variables and LSTM for all three variables. Uh, we ha had some, they had some issues with the, uh, yeah, getting some, some differences in the fitting. I think there were some issues with the plotting. Th this is a bug in the actual code, not uh, say it's from, from, the, from the team. Uh, So, so we are the linear models didn't do particularly well. The random forest and the neural network, though, did provide pretty good improvements. Uh, the training time is real. Kernels are, are, in, are in species. Uh, kernels, in this case, referring to the the Jupiter Lab kernels, which frequently crashed. Uh, they 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 are not very forgiving if you run if you if you hit the memory limit. That there there's no swap on the on the Jupiter Lab, so unlike a a, a regular supercomputer or, or a laptop, so it just dies. Uh, the domain learning curve is steep for for non geoscientists, rightfully so. Uh, and tools are easy to use, but need experience to use effectively. The team 55, uh, they, they, they try linear model, decision tree, random forest, and gradient boosting. Uh, it looks like the linear model didn't do particularly well, but they, the things got better with the decision tree and gradient boosting. Uh, still some, definitely some off predictions, but I, I, I've seen that happen with everything and with, with this particular data set. Um, Definitely getting a lot better values, with similar values for random forest and gradient boosting, uh, and and really high R squared on that. So team fifty seven uh, on Monday they they constructed decision trees for the different variables using the potential input variables and meta variables. Means were 0 0.04, 0 0.066, zero six six and 0.185. So those are those are pretty pretty good uh, on this problem. Uh, decision trees actually seem to work quite well for this. Uh, especially increasing the number of hidden layers does not increase the confusion accuracies. Uh, false positive ratio for NR10 tau increased when number of hidden layers increased from two to four to eight. So yes, uh, a deeper model does not always improve performance. It, it's easier to overfit and uh, especially with the data we have. Uh, so here, here's some more in-depth statistics that they were able to get, get pretty good performance with QR10 and NR10 for four hidden layers and for two hidden layers. But yeah, uh, in my experience, the hyperparameter search is, like, there's a lot more variance in the uh, as as you add more hidden layers. Uh, And Thursday, they tried some interpretation methods, including permutation importance to find out which features are most important for the classifiers. Uh, NR talent for QR talent explains 33%. QC talent explains 29%. QR talent uh, explains 12%. Uh, and then they looked at uh, uh, some like, uh, for NC, QC 10 actually explains the most. For NR 10, QR uh, talent explain, explains the most. Interestingly enough, it's not the 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 the, same, the input that was linked to the output. It's kind of there. There are definitely some some more indirect connections there. The order of the importance stays the same if you increase the number of epics and number of hidden layers. Uh, now we're going to go on to Team Fifty Nine. Um, they, they made some really cool visualizations. Uh, uh, kind of have this. Uh, Distribution of where all the points in the data set are. Uh, we have a lot of them. Uh, kind of, kind of, it's like they're plotting in terms of uh, of indices, and we have a lot more toward the the, the top here. It looks like um, they made some interactive visualization using the IPy widgets module. I'm glad that actually that worked. Uh, Cor uh, some correlation plots and other maps, uh, so the temperature in the data set, and so so appreciate them, yeah, you know, doing some other cool correlation plots like see here. Um, so 
exploratory visualization is really important to actually learning more about the data and learning about some of the, the specialness and, and, and qualities of it that, that may be problems you, you run into. Um, they, they tested linear regression, decision tree, and random forest regression uh, and compared with densely connected neural network and a convolutional neural network. Um, they interpolated the temperature and the temperature at diff uh, different depths. Uh, and they're and they're confused that uh, so they have for linear regression did particularly badly random forest uh, the, the single decision tree actually seemed to do fairly well this is a consistent result across multiple uh, ones and the random forest provide somewhat of an improvement but not as much as you'd think interestingly enough uh, and the, the digital network in this case didn't do particularly well but, but these are a lot more sensitive to um, uh, properties of the data uh, main conclusions of CNN-based model can emulate the behavior of a model in incomplete data, but the accuracy of the model is not very high at the moment. The most accurate model was a random forest with a mean absolute error of 0.06 in the test sample. So, uh, yeah, yeah, this is definitely a problem where without, if you didn't have a lot of time to mess with it like this, random forest is probably going to get you, get you the best. With the neural network, if you have enough time and hyperparameter searching, you can, I'm sure you can do better. But uh, but yeah, I think that's a consistent result we've seen across the, the, the different ones. So thank you for your attention on that. Um, we'll see if there's any questions in, on the Slido. Uh, nothing on the Slido and uh, let's see if uh, nothing, nothing in the Slack right now. So we'll go ahead and uh, if, if, if Charlie's ready, we can, um, uh, move on to uh, the gecko. Yep, that sounds great. DJ, let me see if I can share my slides here. Okay, is that working for everybody? Yeah, okay. looks good. Perfect. All right, everybody. Um, I'm Charlie. I'm going to present the uh, the Gecko A uh, Atmospheric Chemistry Emulator Challenge. So, as a uh, a quick review to the problem here, um, Gecko A is a, a hyper explicit atmospheric chemistry model uh, that can model up to I mean hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of chemical reactions. Uh, taking place uh, throughout the atmosphere. And it is, at this point in time at least, totally unfeasible to run this model in a global climate model um, due to computational cost. So the big idea here is to, to create, you know, a training library of this, you know, uh, Gecko A generated data, see if we can emulate this process and then put the emulator uh, into the global climate model. So this problem is, uh, you know, a little bit different. We just talked about an emulator problem with the microphysics problem, uh, but this one particularly is a time series emulator, which makes this problem a little bit unique. Uh, and so as a result of this one, what the data kind of looks like is 2000 different gecko simulations uh, with each run composing of approximately 1440 time steps uh, that equal five days in length. And so to look at that, you know, in a little bit more detail, again, we got a total of 2000 experiments, uh, 300 second time set deltas for 1440 time sets uh, per experiment. So this is uh, five days uh, per experiments. And then our input variables to this are, are these nine variables here. We've got the, the, the VOC precursor uh, in mass, the mass of gases of the uh, particular uh, species that we're looking at, and in this problem is dodecane. Uh, and then we've also got the mass uh, of dodecane in the aerosol phase. And then we've got some environmental variables of temperature, solar zenith angle, uh, any pre existing aerosols in the atmosphere, uh, ozone, uh, nitrogen oxide compounds, and um, the, uh, the oxal hyd hydroxyl. Uh, I'm sure the, uh, the OH compounds as well. 
Um, but you'll see that these uh, stay, the environmental variables are static per experiment. And so those do not vary. In real life, these, these are going to vary. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, that later on. But um, ultimately, the input variables per experiment are static environmental conditions and then varying uh, precursor gas and aerosol masses. And so our base model is trying to predict these same three um, output variables, the, the precursor, the gas, and the aerosol mass, but just at the, the following time set, T plus one. So as a, as a further approximation of this, what I just described there is the base model here, right? Which is this, this input of these nine different variables and then trying to output um, the three variables at the next time step. But to, to run this forward in time, we're, we're gonna use a box emulator model and so what this looks like is we're going to take the starting conditions of an experiment. This is most likely T0, although it could be any point in time. And you're going to input that into the base model that we built. And then you're going to generate one prediction out of that, which is just T plus one. So now we're going to take that prediction in this model, you know, combine it back with this, the environmental variables we have, and then feed it back into the base input model and get another prediction. And then feed that back into the base model and do this and iterate over this over and over again up to the length of the experiment. So 1440 you know, potential times, or you could really just go n amount of times um, with this. So, so ultimately the base model is just predicting taking starting conditions and inputting one time step where the box simulator is taking input conditions or starting conditions to predict n time steps. Um, and so you know, intuitively, we can see that it's probably much harder to, you know, to get results out of this box simulator than it would be the base model specifically. So with that, um, we'll, we'll start with the first team. Um, we'll go with team 42. Uh, and here they tested a variety of, of different methods here, uh, including lasso, ridge regression, uh, last to net, um, linear regression, and some tree rate um, decision tree methods as well. And then a variety of, of neural network models um, with LSTM and then the, the CUDA um, implements a kind of LSTM as well, um, which, which I was not totally familiar with. I'm, I'm impressed that they did this. I was reading just a little bit about this, which could potentially speed up the uh, the process of, of training LSTM significantly. And I'm not sure, um, I can't remember if another team implemented this, but I was very impressed that they um, had implemented that. Um, and they see the best performance with linear regression and uh, the, the LSTM, uh, which, which I like that result, right? We have kind of like a more complicated model, but it's showing some similar results to uh, just a similar linear regression model as well. Um, and so some of the visualizations that they have down here are just on the left, we have some, some spaghetti plots. You can see that the kind of the distribution on the bottom of our static variables. Up top, you've got the time series of random experiments for uh, the three output variables of int interest, the precursor gas and aerosols. Um, you can see that there's, you know, a really sharp shift in the precursor in this exponential, you know, like distribution that most likely, you know, potentially has an effect on the, uh, the flattening out of some of the other variables. And you might be able to see that here in the correlation heat map that they you know, nicely provided as well. So with some of the uh, results that they got here with their linear regression here, um, we, we tested, I kind of, as base metrics, we, we looked at uh, root mean squared error, uh, R2 correlation, and then the Hellinger distance. Um, and with this one here, we've got pretty, you know, impressive results, you know, over considering the base model, even with the linear regression, which I think is a great, a great result, right? That, that we don't necessarily always need, you know, the most powerful tool to, to get some decent results. Um, we've also got some some nice results with the, the LSTF here on the right. Um, I don't see a, a truth um, plot on here to compare these, you know, the two plots to specifically, um, but you can see, you know, many of the experiments, and I guess and for people that weren't familiar with this notebook, the way this was initial designed, the, the test and validation sets had approximately, I believe, 200 different experiments, but the base um, box model emulator took about 40 or so seconds to run per experiment. And so as a quick test, we were kind of just testing on, on five, um, 
on five random experiments to, to get results because it would have taken far too long to actually test on on all of the results. So, um, so that's what some of these plots you, you'll see throughout this presentation are kind of representing here. And so with these five separate time series plots, um, in both cases, you get pretty, pretty flat and smooth um, time series lines throughout the entire series using the, the box emulator, which I think is, is pretty impressive. Um, and I didn't see in this slide um, the, the look back length of the, the LSTM, um, which I'll comment on a little bit later. I'm not sure what the size of that was, but that might um, be something of interest when it comes to you know, shaping data uh, for an LSTM. Um, briefly, we got some feature selection stuff, precursors, uh, precursor and so the zenith angle were shown to be um, highly important in these particular models uh, or by the random forest generator. And some of the lessons learned with this, uh, machine learning is a very powerful tool, but precise and sophisticated design of the ML model is required, absolutely. Um, and then use of ML models without consideration often makes a catastrophically bad prediction. Um, definitely, this is something that DJ and some other people have already emphasized, is it's often easier to get, it's much easier to get you know, worse or bad results than it is sometimes to get small improvements. So it's definitely a very iterative process. Um, and then pursuing a best accuracy of ML models does not guarantee successful adoption of an ML model to the prediction of certain phenomena. I think this is, um, especially in, in regards to metrics on the base model and metrics on the, uh, the box emulator, that's specifically true. And we'll, we'll see that in, in some of the other presentations as well. And this is a little bit, I think, unique, right? That you can't really, some of the metrics on, on both of these are different and they don't necessarily kind of map one to one right so a performance great performance on the base you know model does not necessarily mean or map to great performance in uh in the box emulator so we look at team 48 um we looks like they they tested out a variety um of models too kind of you know doing uh Decision trees, linear regression. Uh, they tried, you know, a uh, dense network and then um, failed to implement, uh, but a tried, which I think is awesome, a residual neural nets. Uh, and then for the linear regression model, another team they, they found a, a kind of a simple approach to um, to trying to model this this problem here uh, with the box emulator, and they definitely got some good improvements here. Um, I'm not showing the, the base metrics, but I think the base metrics R twos were maybe around point, point 0.5 and it varied by by output variable but you see nice um r2 values here you got some lower halogens hellinger distance scores which are good which are probably due to the even though i think the general shape is captured in uh in the box simulator here on most of them the magnitude is off by a little bit which is most likely uh the cause of kind of the higher hellinger distances in this particular case but it was just a really nice job again of just taking kind of a, a simpler tool out of the out of the toolbox to to make some nice predictions that can capture kind of the overall pattern uh, through time. So metrics of ML and parameter selection doesn't work well, um, and the RNN doesn't work. I don't when I looked at that, I don't entirely know what that meant. Um, some of that I, I think could be could be on me that when I um, when we design this particular problem, some of the workflow was kind of designed to um, to work with the base model that we had, but doing some other approaches um, and stuff that uh, new pipelines would likely have to be developed, that it didn't completely um, allow for an easy transition to, to some of those, um, to some of the other models and, and, and data shapes and stuff. So um, that, that's possibly what you're, you're referring to. Um, Lessons learned, general ideas about ML and applications of ML in earth sciences and basic knowledge is how to do uh, machine learning in Python. That's awesome. I mean, that's two of the primary goals of this entire hackathon is just to get some practical experience doing machine learning and you know some increased knowledge of, of doing it in Python specifically. So that's fantastic. Um, challenges, having trouble in parameter selection, metrics, and visualization on the models with such limited knowledge on ML packages in Python. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think especially given the amount of time, we had a relatively short amount of time. I mean, just, you know, four, four day, you know, four half days, you know, if that, um, 
and trying to get, you know, figure out how to collaborate with a team in this setting and everything. I, I think it's just amazing what everyone accomplished in this period of time. And so I think that that is absolutely a challenge, but I, you know, um, I hope that, you know, the, the experience proves useful going forward. Okay, on to, to team 23, summary of the methods tried. Um, they added Gaussian noise to help um, to the to the base data to uh, to help improve and kind of uh, perhaps help the model from overfitting. This is awesome. I think this, at least from the slides, this is the only team that did attempt to to add some noise into the process to see if they could get a better fit um, and generalization as a result of that, uh, which is awesome. Um, However, it was not still able to capture the, the full auto correlation of the output variables. Um, yeah, it, it, it's tough. I, mean, I, I love the, I absolutely love the approach. Um, I love below that you, you talked about and, and kind of very clearly showed this the auto regression model, this auto correlation, um, and said that this is motivation for an LSTM architecture. I think that's exactly right. You know, I think that when you really do have non when you, when you have a fairly smooth kind of um, auto regress kind of kind of data set like this, that looking at uh, th that's exactly the types of architectures the LSTMs can help with. Um, so I think that's a fantastic uh, example. Uh, so interpretation of the ML model um, showed score important, showing that the output variable T at, at, at T naught are highly important for T, um, T plus one. And this is coming back to this autocorrelation idea, absolutely. Um, and that otherwise temperature and uh, OH seem to be the most important variables. Um, always, um, always good to know in, in that particular um, yeah, I, I just really enjoy the, the interpret, interpretability there. Um, the challenge of the team face, um, lack of time and workforce, um, absolutely. I, again, I think that the amount that was accomplished in this time is, is amazing. Um, and I hope that, you know, perhaps you'll have time, you know, or if you choose to, you know, to, um, to implement an LSTM method or something that, you, you know, you already proved that there's good motivation to that. So perhaps you'll be able to, to do that in the future if you choose to. Um, and then the Jupyter Lab issues, uh, which David, David John already mentioned a little bit, but, but our apologies for that. And hopefully that that was, uh, didn't result in too much, too much downtime. So moving on to team 10, uh, message try, linear regression, random forest, DNN and LSTM. We'll see that a pretty common trend throughout, uh, throughout this problem. Here we see a nice fit of the, the final LSTM in red, uh, where the dashed line is the truth here. So um, it definitely looks like that's, they got the best um, result with that and kind of split over, split the precursor aerosol and gas out for easier visualization, which I really like. And I, I like the plot on the left here to, to show that, you know, this particular relationship between all of the, um, the variables the input and output does not take a long time to to, to converge on a fit right that a lot of the, the bulk i mean the bulk of the, the training you know we, we get significant improvements in one epoch of training and and minimal results kind of after that right and so we don't know exactly when kind of overfitting you know starts to happen at this point but but everything you know uh converges rather quickly i think is a um, is just a useful and nice plot to see um so the metrics for the base versus the metrics for their LSTM. Um, their challenge is says, you know, our best model did not outperform the, the base model in this particular case. Um, I think that, you know, I'll go back to the question A as I, what, um, I am curious as to how many look back steps you use for the, the particular LSTM in this case. Um, but I think more importantly, what I'll mention is, although the model here did not outperform the, the base model, I think there's a reasonably good chance that this model, despite not performing better for the base model, could perform significantly better for the, the box emulator. Um, again, that those do not necessarily map map one to one. So I think that you know it's important to look at metrics for both. But um, had you had the time, I think to to implement this into the box uh, model, you might have seen that your model did did quite well in that particular problem. And then uh, challenges interpretation of an LSTM model. I think that's um, 
that's a good topic. I don't know how much of that was uh, covered in the lectures overall this week. I didn't, I didn't get to um, catch all of Chao Peng's talk uh, on LSTNs and some of his work. I'm not sure how much it was covered in some of the other ones, but um, I will mention, you know, a particular paper in, in hydrology that, that shows a really nice kind of interpretation of an LSTM that was used to, to model, I think it was Kratzert um, et al. That, that went to I think it was rainfall runoff prediction using LSTMs, and ultimately they used a look back period of the entire year of like 365 days, and they took the the weights the, of the cell states um, out of the or the cell state yeah, values out of the LSTM and showed that it was actually learning uh, snowmelt dynamics um, when you plotted that through time, which is pretty cool. So there are definitely ways to to provide some sort of interpretation. Um, output from, from these LSTM models. So moving on to 1817, uh, summary of methods tried, we got linear random forest, DNN, um, you know, RNNs and the LSTM style RNNs. Um, we've got, you know, some nice visualization of the distributions. Um, and I love, you know, like the distribution on the left here, seeing that most of the static variables were uniformly sampled across time, where some of the other ones are just simply skewed, and yet other ones have more of an exponential looking distribution. Um, and we got the nice colorful, a little bit um, blurry in this particular, um, the resolution, but uh, the, the transformation, the multiple transformations that they applied and then used a nice seaborne violin plot to really map the distri distribution, I think is a, a great and effective way to, to look at the distributions of, of data. So as far as their results, uh, they also see that um, after just a, you know, a couple of epochs that um, the model of, um, has captured most of, most of the relationship between the, the two. Uh, they were the only team to use a, a Taylor diagram to, to map what looks like bias, the, the bias variance trade-off and found that uh, all their, most of the models here perform very, very similarly in, in the same general area. Um, again, this I, I think I'll you know just stress that although they're performing similarly here in the in the base model, I don't know if that's going to be true in the in the box emulator itself. Um, so model prediction shows good agreement with validation data. Absolutely, uh, this appears to be from the the base model here. Um, I don't know for sure. As it, oops, as it's not not labeled. But uh, lessons learned from, from the hackathon. Fanciest tool is not always the best. Uh, awesome, I love that. I think that was a you know, lesson from a couple of different teams here. You know, although this a whole seminar is, uh, was designed around uh, machine learning and a lot of it was centered around deep learning, uh, I think it's important to realize what, what deep learning can do, what problems are better suited for deep learning, or maybe even just like what kind of gains are we expected to get from a deep learning approach. Uh, I think this problem is a good one to show that you can do, you know, uh, you can get a lot accomplished with, with linear models, you know, decision trees and everything, and maybe you can get some improvement with, with this one included, right, with some deep learning methods, but how much improvement are you really expecting to get compared to some other ones? Um, data preparation pipeline scaling is really important, absolutely, especially, oops, I'm sorry, uh, especially when it comes to uh, preparation of, of, of time series and LSTM data and everything, um, the data prep part is often the, uh, the bulk of the work, for sure. Uh, even with non-Gaussian transformation, the result was good. I think it's awesome you tried, you know, multiple transformations and then found that you got somewhat similar results, at least most likely in the, in the initial base model. Uh, precision is as important as accuracy. I think in this context, in a regression problem, that's probably referring to bias and variance, uh, both being important. You can't improve one without the other um, and, and the trade-off between those. Um, and the challenge is the spin-up time. Um, overall, I, I don't entirely um, know what that means, but, um, but yeah. So team four, uh, lessons learned. So the, the main problem was to change the dimensionality to perform CNN or LSTM. Again, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll comment again on, on this towards the end. I, I think that many teams got got to this point and, and just found um, found it to be very challenging. And and, and it one hundred percent is there. It is no no easy task to to kind of understand. Um, 
the shapes and the transformations uh, the, the need to happen um, to make those models work. Uh, we're unable to set the box simulator to predict the whole time series, um, something you need more time for understanding as far as the box simulator goes. Um, totally. And I just want to provide you, you're more than welcome to reach out to me or the team um, directly if, if you're looking for more understanding or, again, if you want to continue trying on the Open Jupyter Hub or CoLab project, um, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, visualizations on the side, we've got a correlation matrix on the side, again, to kind of show some of the, um, the relationships between variables and another uh, visualization showing pretty good autocorrelation between a couple of different variables. So the uh, results from Team 4, uh, they tried standard and Gaussian PDF scaling functions, uh, tried linear regression of random forest, uh, PCA, which is inapplicable though, though I'm assuming uh, due to just the, the small dimensionality or the number of raw features we had to begin with, um, and tried LSTM, but it had the data challenges. So went with a uh, density network with different hyperparameter settings, um, which is a great choice because the, the initial base model that we had did not have, it was not, um, it was not highly tuned at all. And so I think that if that is an approach that is a workable solution, I, that is definitely a, a fantastic place to start. So you can see some of their results down here. Um, it looks like the ones that they listed where they changed the activation function, uh, going from um, ReLU to, to Sigmoid and kind of changing the, the depth, um, which I think initially was two layers and changed it to five layers. And then went from, you know, every, everywhere from 50 up to 300 neurons per layer. Um, in this particular case, I think with the, the dense neural network specifically, you can see some really, some really strange results when you run the box simulator like this, um, which is, I think, to be, to be expected, right? Sometimes, especially, I think, if the neural network in this case is just a little bit overfit to some of the, um, the data, you can get some really strange actions because, again, you're only... You're only modeling one time step at a time, so it's, it's likely that if, if you have an error pretty early on in this box emulator, that's just going to propagate and, and get much worse or completely stabilize in the wrong, in the wrong area. And so solving that problem is, is no easy task whatsoever. Um, and the metric shown in the table using learning rate 01 and, oops, uh, and five layers would increase the model score. Um, I, I certainly don't doubt it, and, and that's awesome. All right, uh, team 33. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, a shout out here to uh, Wei Ming of team 33, who contacted me and, and let me know of the, the bug that we had found, um, or that he found uh, in the, my initial data prep function that, uh, that we kind of fixed um, via over the, the general channel. Um, but thank you for that and then kind of working through that um, together and then ultimately even providing a solution. So I, I definitely really, really appreciate that. And um, apologize for the, the, the small kind of indexing error that was, that was present um, and kind of hard to spot uh, to begin with. Uh, a summary of their methods they tried, sort of random forest, the, the DNN, and then went with ultimately an LSTM because it's well known for time series prediction, definitely. And then they went with the standardization, um, given an overview of the base data here. Um, and then I'd like to point out, you know, they, I, I like that they pointed out the exact shape of, of, of how they shape their data for their LSTM. The input training data in 3D um, equals the, the number of experiments in the training data set, which is 1,400 times 1435, and this is because they had to shave off five particular time steps because they're making sequences of length five. So you have to shave that data off to be able to, to match it up properly. Um, so you end up with approximately, you know, 2.1 or so million um, samples. And then you've got uh, the dimension, the second dimension of dimension five, which is they're using sequence lengths of, of length five. Um, and then they've got the nine input variables. So this is the, the shape that the LSTM data needs to be in. And so in essence, they said that we want to use the nine features from the five previous time sets to inform the information on the next time step. Um, exactly, well, you know, well said. And as a result, they, um, they got really nice results here with their, with their uh, box emulator. And so with this, with the, with the box emulator, um, you can see some uh, 
you know, some shortcomings in magnitude of, of the precursor, and then aerosol seem to be a little bit more difficult to predict than, than the gas phase specifically. But ultimately, I mean, a, a fantastic uh, fit to the, you know, to the, the validation or testing data um, via the box emulator. Um, and I, I suspect this is, although I know some of the other teams have tried LSTMs, but I, I suspect that some of this was due to increasing just the, um, the sequence length, you know, to, um, to five in, in, in length. That way the data is learning off of the entire sequence of this to, to be able to capture this. Um, and so their architecture included uh, 64 neurons. They also use a dropout uh, layer of 20% to prevent overfitting. Um, tested by MSE, Atom Optimizer, um, and just five, five epochs. Um, I would have loved to see what some of the actual, the, the number metrics are in this particular case. But nonetheless, I think this is considered, you know, a, a um, close to, you know, a, if not, you know, an adequate solution to, to this particular problem, at least with this particular data. So lastly, I'll go to, to Team 14. Um, team 14, uh, they, you know, did some nice data exploration uh, and using the, you know, random forest, uh, as many, many teams did, found the precursor was the, the leading variable of choice. I think this is, um, what most teams found and probably expected due to that just rapid exponential um, decrease that, uh, that stabilizes so quickly. Um, and then they, uh, their neural networks tried, you know, a simple RNN, uh, a deep, you know, convolutional network, and then an LSTM, uh, and then tested sensitivity to different hyperparameters. Um, some significant things, they also independently found and fixed the time, uh, time lag bug in the prepare data. Um, so very nice job on, on that. Um, they wrote, you know, an entire new pipeline for preparation, the emulators to be compatible with the time series analysis. I mentioned this a little bit earlier that it is, uh, that, that it was, the, the fact that the, the base model and, and functions, um, really it works well with the, the deep neural network portion of that, but as soon as you increase the time steps that, that it didn't have the, the full framework to accommodate for that. So, so some of that stuff did, did need to be rewritten. Um, and then there were functions for easy visualizations and workflow. Um, difficulty is learning Python on the fly. I'm not necessarily sure who's learning these, you know, Python on the fly, but that's fantastic work to be able to, you know, learn a language and kind of, you know, uh, implement and then solve some machine learning problems simultaneously. So that's that's certainly a, a challenge in itself. Um, and I like this 3D, uh, three-dimensional figure we've seen in some other presentations and showing the nonlinearity between the three different output variables. So here's just, just one plot of hyperparameter um, visualizations. And I think the most important thing that, that I want to mention that I, that I really like about this, specifically with time series data, is that Oftentimes in hyperparameter tuning, we're, we're just kind of focused on overall these metrics, right? Like RMSE or, um, or R2 or whatever. But when we're really focused on like time series prediction, sometimes, you know, when the error happens makes a difference, right? And so if you're not accounting that in your base metrics, sometimes the easiest way to do that is, is in a visualization like this, right? So specifically with, you know, something like the, the box model or something, you might have great, um, you might follow along with it, with the validation great for the first you know 500 time steps and then you see it veer off suddenly you know and get but you could end up with the same particular rmses there maybe one doesn't really follow it at all you know but that but it's kind of near the middle and ends up getting the same value so nonetheless i just think that there's really awesome value in also visualizing some of the, the hyperparameter tuning and here's just a variety of examples of of different uh different stuffs on, on different variables like learning rate uh activation function uh and, and number of neurons and so their results um actually used you know the um this, the exact same sequence link. So they also had uh, all nine input variables at um, using T, T minus one through T minus five to predict T. So also a sequence length of five. I would love to hear from these teams if, um, if that was kind of a, a tuned part of the data preparation aspect, or if that was just the first kind of round number that wasn't one that you decided to try and it seemed to work out well. Um, I, I would love to know if that was actually 
um, tuned or not uh, in this particular case. Um, so their architecture was a bit different than the previous teams. They had um, two layers of 100 neurons each. Um, and they actually have the metrics here, but you can, you can again see with this one, their box emulator did really, really well, um, especially with the precursor, which is a bit more stable between all the different experiments. Um, but they also, like, like many teams, have found out that the aerosol phase uh, seems to be a little bit trickier to, uh, to predict than, than the gas phase or the, or the precursor itself. But their ultimate metrics here on the side um, with very small halogen distance, really nice correlation. Um, you can see again, the, the aerosols one just um, lagging a little bit behind, but, but again, ultimately I think that with some, some time, as they say here in the top left, we can do better given more time and more computational power. Absolutely. But I think this is just so cool to see that we definitely have um, some solutions to this particular problem. So the only, I just really want to make a quick conceptual note on LSTMs and why they're good for time series prediction. So I don't know how much this was, this was covered, but it started in the NLP or natural language processing uh, fields, you know, in the late nineties or so. But, you know, if you take this example sentence, you know, I grew up in France where I embraced the language and became fluent in blank. As a human, it's really easy. We have like good memory persistence, right? So it's easy to, to inform that we know that that word should be French, you know, with relatively little thought. But really what that is, is that's being informed directly from two words, right? Language and France, which if we consider each one of these words a time step, which in a sense they really are, right? You're really getting the information from, you know, five and then 10, 10 steps, you know, time steps behind the actual prediction, right? So, you know, a dense neural network or something, when you're just predicting T plus one, you're trying to learn, you know, from the word in, that, that the next word should be French in this particular case, you know? So you'd have to have some pretty bizarre training data to actually make that correct. So I think this is a good example that just really shows why, you know, in the last couple of examples, we saw a sequence length of a certain length, right? That you're taking the trends of data through time there to really have that inform you know, your decision on the next time step, which just makes such, um, such a big difference in this particular, um, for time series analysis often. So with that, the, the summary here is, um, you know, between all these presentations is, uh, results in the baseball do not always translate to directly to the box emulator. Um, and then I think this is, this is seen in, in some particular, um, particular cases. Um, Secondly, data preparation for RNN or LSTM is not easy. Um, definitely not. I think it's challenging enough to take one continuous time series and try to transform it in a way that has a, a sequence length longer than one um, ready for an LSTM. But let alone once that is separated by experiments, you now have to do that for every single experiment over and over again. And then furthermore, you have to change the, you know, the sequence length of in putting this into the actual box simulator as well. So that entire pipeline was 100% not an easy task. I, I think it's just amazing the, the work that some of these teams did, um, you know, attempting to do that and, and um, just awesome stuff. Uh, so LSTM with five look like time seems to be an adequate solution to this problem. Um, which is great. And next, you know, our next step would be to see if this model would perform well with varying environmental factors. This is, um, you know, we trained, our, our hope with this was, was to have static environmental variables for the training data of 1400 different experiments to learn on, right? And so the, the hope was to learn that even though that there were many static through the experiment, that there's enough variation over the experiments for them to be able to learn that, to, to deal with it when they actually do vary within an experiment as well. So it'd be fantastic to take these, you know, a model, like some of the models that were developed by the participants here, and then to see how well it actually works with um, time or time varying environmental factors per experiments as well. And so I had so much fun um, helping out with this project and, and, and helping you all out and just being a part of this. Um, just fantastic job to, to everybody. Um, I, your work was just awesome and it was a pleasure. So um, thank you so much. And with that, I guess I will pass the torch back to uh, DJ for goes. All right, thank you, Charlie. Uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of great solutions there on, on the Gecko project. Uh, there were a couple of questions that have popped up. Um, 
Yep, we, we are going to try to work on sharing individual presentations uh, or the individual notebooks. Uh, not exactly sure what the best format for that will be if, if we'll like throw it up in a big GitHub repository, just send a link out to the Google Drive, but uh, we'll, we'll try to get that out in the, in the next week or so. Um, and, and yeah, Team 17 did post a, 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 a better looking uh, tailored diagram in the Slack channel that, uh, that, that, is quite, that is quite impressive. So for those who are in the hackathon, take a look at that. Uh, uh, but what we're gonna do now is uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna close out with goes and, 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 and get this wrapped up. Uh, so let me go ahead and share screen. Uh, All right, uh, uh, for the broader audience, whoever is still watching, the, the Go's problem focused on using Go 16, uh, the geostationary satellite to predict uh, uh, lightning, giving cloud information, predict uh, lightning uh, uh, in the next hour. Uh, basically provided uh, three infrared or four infrared channels, three water vapor at different levels, as well as kind of the regular infrared channel for GOES. And our, our target was this flash counts variable. So how, how many lightning strikes happened in, in a given box. And we saw a number of different approaches to this from the teams that, 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 that submitted. Uh, this is some example data that, that they were given. Uh, so we have examples with lightning activity, and you'll notice the 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 uh, temperature, the brightness temperatures, uh, which is the contours are, are generally lower uh, for those compared with the no lightning, uh, since basically you have colder cloud tops from thunderstorms that are producing lightning, but then you're looking at the ground generally when when there isn't lightning. Uh, so, so we'll start with team two uh, on GOES. They, they tested out uh, now their pictures here. So, so you can see we have, a, this is a very uh, distributed team. We have Boulder, Albany, Saskatchewan, and France. So, so one of the cool things about this hackathon is we're a very international collaboration. And I really appreciate all the people who, who, who logged in from Europe and Asia, at, especially at really odd times of day for, for y'all. So thank you for taking the time and sacrifice this week to, to, to do that. Uh, and and, we'll, and for future hackathons, we'll hopefully try to arrange for some more of a time distributed type system so, so, so that you don't have to be up at midnight. Uh, uh, that said, back, back, uh, back to the problem, we wanted, uh, this team tested uh, some tree-based methods, uh, linear polynomial regression, as well as densely connected and convolutional neural networks, so kind of the span of methods. Uh, we have, have from the, the baseline notebook the, the distribution of the patches, the da data with and without lightning activity, so there's some clear differences in there, and so there should be some signal to learn from our machine learning model. Uh, in this case, the, there, the team's main contribution was for the CNN was adding not just the the raw image patches, but also additional metadata, the latitude, longitude, and time of day. So having location and timing information can potentially be useful when trying to predict thunderstorms because there is definitely a diurnal cycle and a location bias associated with them. Uh, in this case, uh, I've got too many things over over here. Uh, the we, we can compare with RMSC, Briar score, and AUC, and we see that uh, their CNN Plus uh, generally performed the best in terms of all the different metrics. Uh, the baseline linear regression is the worst, and we got some improvements with either gradient boosting or polynomial, so, interestingly enough. Uh, they also found, uh, and this was something we saw in Holodeck, is that changing your scaling from from min max to standard scaling actually significantly improved the baseline model, which is, which is kind of cool. Uh, the three degree polynomial regression outperformed the tree based methods. So sometimes, yeah, really stupid, simple methods do work pretty well. Um, but the, the CNN deep learning actually did prove out to be a, a big improvement. So, uh, and then there's also, they tested batch normalization that improved training speed, but did not end up improving performance. So yeah, you know, it may have some other side benefits uh, sometime. Uh, it really is very problem dependent and it may also help more with a deeper network compared with the ones you probably were testing for this. Uh, let's see. 
And here's all their numbers for all the different things they tried. Uh, particularly looking at AUC, we, we see the biggest improvement with CNN. It looks like they didn't train it for a particularly long time, only three to five epics, but due to the, the challenges with dealing with the Jupyter Hub, the, it, it takes a while, even with the GPUs on there, it takes a while to train. We had the K80s, uh, NVIDIA K80 GPUs, so they're a bit older, still good, but, but they're like, like you, you'd be able to train for more epics with a bigger machine and a newer GPU with, I think with more stability, so. Uh, we we do appreciate the, the work they put in here. Uh, let's see. We'll move on to Team 8, uh, working on Go's. Uh, they, they apply some fun uh, joint distribution of, of uh, mean patch brightness temperatures uh, with and without lightning. And, and so we, 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 we see some of this, the the uh, cross correlations. There, there's a lot. There's a lot of auto correlation in the different uh, in the different variables, but but there's definitely you see more uh, concentration of the variables at cooler temperatures with with lightning versus without. Um, also, the the lightning patches have colder and with wider joint distributions, but less skewed across bands. No lightning patches have skewed joint distributions, especially with the window channel, which senses either the surface warm temps or cloud top emission cold temps at, at or below water band weighting functions. So next we have the ghost predictions on the test data. This team implemented, uh, they, they did some, some different approaches. Uh, best of all runs is a standard scalar ResNet with an AUC of point, point 0.903. Uh, however, all the other methods have a higher AUC and lower MSC relative to the baseline ResNet. Uh, most of them are, are like maybe flipped on that one. Uh, most of the metrics also are better. AUC compute using binary predictions. 1D methods use percentile predict predictors as they perform better than the minimum alone. Uh, all the methods seem to do pretty well in this problem. So it's a relatively straightforward one, but yeah, still a fair bit of skill for, for, for an hour prediction. So, so it's good to see. And we have our rock curve over here. The, so you see how they all, all line up with each other. Uh, team 30. Um, we also tried a lot of different machine learning models. Uh, they tried ResNet, standard ComNet, two-layer CNN, three-layer CNN, two-layer ANN. Uh, and they found the CNN did, in fact, uh, provide a, a, a big bump in accuracy. Um, there are some other scores laid out here for the ResNet versus a CNN versus two layer and three layer CNN. In their case, the ResNet did actually a little bit worse. Um, the One of the technical challenges here was a necessity of good knowledge of Python and uh, needing some ML experience. Uh, and, and then they also preferred some some more step-by-step -step explanations for, for how this works. So yeah, we, with some of the notebooks, we, we did kind of throw you there could we'll, we can work on improving the documentation and laying things out better for, for future versions of this. Uh, team 37, uh, we have a, they, they tried a bunch of different methods and they again also found that using standard scalar plus ResNet seemed to do the best. Uh, so, so, so it's one of those that even the, the pre-processing can, can give you a bigger difference than sometimes some of the other settings you tried. Uh, they also tried things like LSTM with PCA and dense neural network, uh, gradient boosting and uh, random forest. And so, so a whole bunch of different methods here. Uh, for the random forest, they, they looked at all the different uh, principal components that they put in and PC one and two seem to explain most of the information. So, so the variance explained correlates pretty well with the feature importance, that's good to see. Um, and then CNN converged fairly quickly too, which is, which is also interesting to see. Um, LSTM also converged fairly, like training continued to improve, but uh, like the validation flattened out pretty pretty fast. Uh, Team 39 had a, had a really cool theme on their slide, I have to say. Um, they compared a decision tree, a simple decision tree, um, 
with a random forest of 10 trees and then a CNN with max pooling. And they actually did some statistical pre-processing with uh, the standard deviation, minimum, medium, and for all, for all four bands. So kind of a more traditional ML approach. Uh, and what they found was that, so model one, which presuming is a single decision tree, got an AUC of 0.83, uh, model two, 0.87, and then the model three is 0.89. So, so random forest got pretty, there, there wasn't a huge uh, 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 difference there, but yeah, it definitely got, got an improvement uh, in, all the, in all the scores that went up pretty consistently. So. But they did mention dis the diminishing returns with increasing complexity. So they did an improvement, but it was a smaller degree of improvement as you uh, as you went up. Uh, team forty four. They they uh, also got some results with the convolutional neural net. Uh, some noisiness b between epics uh, in the training process. Uh, they were getting point eight nine six. So pretty con everyone's getting pretty consistently around point nine AUC for their for their for their results. Um, And they, one of their insights was they used a very large dropout, 0.75, and the model can act as an ensemble. So, so yeah, one one thing that we didn't talk about a lot this week was uncertainty quantification. And one thing you can do is a, a simple uncertainty quantification, something called Monte Carlo dropout, where you uh, turn on dropout during the prediction phase, and you can run the same example through a bunch of times and get uh, a PDF of, of results that way. Uh, so that you see the distribution of the training validation lightning counts, um, and then correct versus wrong predictions um, on the right. Uh, and they found that model learns the general cases as problems at low lightning counts are in cases where the images don't look like the general case. Uh, and I'm assuming what, what they're saying there is like, uh, so, so we have some some case study examples. So we have a, a patch with lightning activity, a patch with uh, no no lightning activity, and correctly predicted. Uh, so basically, it was pretty uniform kind of patch. And then there's more texture in the patch of lightning activity. But then this is one where there, there were zero lightning counts, but cause of it is lightning events. So there, so in this case, there may be a storm or it's cloudiness ongoing, but then it may have moved out or stopped thunder, uh, thundering before the, like into the next hour. Uh, and then let's have one lightning count classified as a no lightning event because there wasn't much texture there. And it was, so so yeah, there's definitely some instances here where you're only having the local information is not sufficient to get to, to get a good prediction where you may need to bring in other variables that, that might describe the, the environment to better condition things. Uh, team 53 explored decision trees, random forest, linear regression, and neural networks. Uh, they did a, they did both a, a, a flash count regression, binary classification, and then a bin severity classification. So, so, so they actually tried to, to not, not just predict like a straight value, but, but divide into five, five bins based off of the lightning count values to see how, see how to see how they did. Um, you also see some uh, variation in accuracy w during, during the, the training for the neural network. So, so there's some time periods where the, the scores actually drop quite a bit. Um, and if they're, I'm not sure which model they're using for this particular one, but uh, it, it does look like one of the, the for the validation, yeah, there, there's some cases where some weights changed and you get a drop in performance, but then it seemed to recover. So so, so that's, that's good to see. Um, also tested different convolutional curves Kernel side and found found a looks like a ten by ten by ten uh, seemed to do do really well on the test percentage. Uh, Team fifty three also had this really cool. Uh, they're actually doing some some deep learning interpretation, which I think is one of the only teams I've seen that that that, that ended something. So they got they got uh, grad cam working uh, on, on this problem. Uh, interestingly enough. Uh, the color scale is a little bit hard to pick out, but, but I'm assuming they're picking, they seem to be picking up on the storm. Uh, in particular, they wanted to highlight this, uh, uh, this particular spot that had particularly low cloud top temperature. Um, 
it's like near near kind of where where you'd expect the leaf to be. Um, and then you, you can also you also appear to see some some kind of uh, interesting artifacts, some 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 lines here in the in the column combin max pooling. So there's I don't know if that's an artifact of the GOES data itself. Uh, the, these these little lines are showing up in there. Uh, it also has some other kinds of gradients, uh, uh, something called sensitivity and smooth grad. Um, the occlusion sensitivity seems to highlight this this region here that is also circled here. Uh, and then we can also see sort of the outputs of, the, of some of the different convolutional layers. Uh, they also investigate the, the misclassification of both extreme and minimal events. Uh, extreme event occlusion sensitivity picks up on an overshooting top, often associated with intense convection. So, yeah, yeah, updraft overshooting top. Yeah, if you get one, it's definitely a, a sign you have a stronger storm. Um, challenges encountered: they experienced overfitting on the training data and difficulty managing class imbalances. So, yeah, these are two common problems you, you experience with complicated data sets and rare event data sets. And they have, have various scores here. They're, Rock AUC is pointing to them that they were doing a five class classification. So, so that's definitely a, a harder problem compared with the binary situation. Uh, team 61 and Goose Team uh, has some examples of high and low lightning activity. Show that the lightning counts are highly skewed. We have a lot of zeros and then, then it drops off pretty fast. It's, Probably looks a little bit nicer on a log scale, but um, it gives you a sense of the range of values that we're dealing with. We also found that if you plot it by hour of the day, they, that in fact most of the because this was the the satellite in over the central, I'd expect you see most of the flash counts in the uh, late noon, early evening the UTC. So so to to. I'm assuming, and then, but then you also can repeat may be associated with things like uh, MCSs. So, uh, fun, fun, lots of interesting data to 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 do. Um, another another uh, similar conclusion to a lot of the other teams. The CNN does best, but not by a whole lot compared with some of the other methods. So, question is, is it worth the extra effort? Uh, really depends on your computational resources and how much the extra bump in accuracy is worth for your particular application. Because in some cases, a small bump in accuracy can mean millions of dollars and 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 cost savings. So, so there, that's always a, a decision one has to factor into the process. Um, mentioned in feature importance, two methods gave consistent across across tree-based methods considering mean standard deviation maximum and median average over the grid in all bands, but degrees of importance varied. Uh, so they're showing the comparison between permutation and purity importance, and they seem to be somewhat correlated with each other uh, in, in this case. Um, and then in, term, in terms of the single pass forward permutation importance of random forest interpretation show that minimum over grid on channels 10, 14 are most important. So that actually kind of makes sense. The uh, uh, 14 is infrared, 10 I think is low level water vapor. Um, and then yeah, minimum is going to basically be where your lowest brightness temperature is in the image. Uh, They, they tried a lot of different features and I appreciate them doing, going the next step and doing the, all the interpretation results. So they also found looks like their XG boost approach uh, got a really good, the random forest got a really good AUC on this problem, 0.92, which is I think better than I've seen on any of the, any of the other ones. So uh, great job to team 61. And with that, that is all of our results on goes. Uh, and we'll go ahead and stop share. Finally, I'd like to, so that that concludes our hackathon summary. Uh, we've got a lot of really interesting results. Uh, I appreciate all the hard work teams did, and I think they got found a lot of really interesting things in the data. Uh, and, and some of them were, I think, were able, able to make really good strides. And everyone else, I think, I hope you all got a, a good learning experience out 
for this and more practical machine learning skills and hope you have a, be able to provide you all the resources and ideas and things to think about as you consider whether you want to do machine learning in your research or if you're already doing machine learning where to go next with it so uh, thank you very much thank you for sticking with us through through this whole process uh, thank you everyone who who's in presentations throughout the week it's a lot of work and and you, you all did wonderful so um, with that, uh, I say have a happy Friday evening. Have a have a good hope everyone can get some rest and see you later. Thank you.